Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. We're glad you could join us for another fun-filled half hour of conversation. We're sitting in this now really glorious new set with these very elegant and comfortable chairs. If any of our panelists would happen to fall asleep during this half hour, you'll know why. The chairs are just so very, very comfortable. We also want to welcome you on the Russian Day of Conception. This will date the filming of our, of our particular program, but as we were remarking before we started, what has this world come to? I don't know what it's come to, but we can at least talk a little bit about Sheboygan and some of the um, various activities and antics of the city since the last time we uh, met. The city and the county, of course. Um, most interesting to me, other than the police station actually getting started and, and, and hiring among a police officer, a real police officer, is the news that the firefighters union has agreed that for new hires, people will be required to live in the city. That feels fairly revolutionary to me. Tom, you... You've been there, right? Well, I've been there. And the, I mean, this the isn't Russia, but... The, the firefighters, <laughs> when I was there, they lobbied that they didn't have to live in the city. And sure. We established a resident... Uh, a residency requirement only for directors of the city, employees mm -hmm. of the city, and a non-supervisory role or a non-director role didn't have to live in the city. And the police and the fire, they wanted it. And now it's 180. I mean, I'm just, I don't know what's happening. Well, according <laughs> to the uh, newspaper, it, uh, this was part of the deal uh, that they would agree to do this uh, if the fire department got the ambulance service, uh, presumably because if you're operating ambulances and something happens, you'd want people closer by. I'm not sure that that line of reasoning actually works, but the interesting statistics in the newspaper, at least, according to Ed Surik, our uh, human resources director, uh, 535 of Sheboygan municipal employees, of all of the employees, 62% um, live within the city. So quick, how many don't live inside the city? That would be 38 percent. Mm -hmm. Is that true, Professor I, Mathematics? I don't know if it's true. No, I mean, 38% is right, but okay, I don't know good. if 38% <laughs> is a true number. Uh, <laughs> 62 plus 38 is, is equal to 100. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just but, sometimes I make those mistakes. Hey, and yeah. um, uh, and um, of firefighters, uh, it's pretty much split. Half live in the city, half live really? outside so the city. So there must be a grandfather's clause on this. Right. You know, like, this would be for new hires. Clauses. Yeah, it would be for or new an hires. In the fire yeah. <laughs> I think there's some excellent reasons for both approaches, uh, but it seems to me that um, overall, it's nice to have your employees within the within the taxing district or the district that pays your wages. Uh, it can lead, I think, to some recruitment issues. Certainly in the school district, lots and lots and lots and lots of teachers. I take that back. I don't know what the statistics are. That would be interesting to well, go the to school the staff directory and take a look at. It's obviously the school district is a is much broader larger. entity than right. the city of Sheboygan. It includes town of Wilson, town of Sheboygan, the township of Cleveland, and who knows what other little burgs are out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how many of our employees um, and administrators, uh, the whole group, will be over 1,000 of us actually live within that confines of that district. It'd be interesting to. Go through the staff directory. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow when I get back. Well, <laughs> get my, back to you about that. My biggest argument for not having a residency requirement is there's uh, you got families that have grown up. You got quali quality people who've grown up around the city of Sheboygan in the Falls or the town of Sheboygan or town mm -hmm. Wilson or Kohler or and they have family homes. They have uh, roots or, or connections and. To, uh, to have a residency requirement to work on in the city, that means they're going to have to pick up and move. And it doesn't seem reasonable. They're, I mean, they're 10, 15 minutes from where their job is by car. Mm -hmm. Although, actually, this, uh, if it is approved by the council and as a part of the collective bargaining agreement, they would agree that this would be only for new hires. I do know when I was on the police and fire commission, we always had lots and lots and lots and lots of applicants for firefighters. So I don't think you can say if you require people to live in the city, you won't have a good pool of folks to choose from, because I think a lot of people will relocate. Um, but this leads to another interesting uh, matter. <clears throat> Tom and I were talking that um, the uh, city is, has really not been able to locate a finance director and has now hired a um, 
uh, uh, headhunter uh, company that locates people uh, to, to assist it. Um, and in the city now, uh, department heads do need to live within the city. I think those are, other than the firefighters now, would be the only, the only group of employees who do need to live in the city. Having been in on some of those interviews for various positions, I can tell you that um, there are some folks who don't necessarily want to live in the city. I find that hard to believe, being a city resident myself. But um, So I think it does have, on those higher levels, it may have some implications for folks who want to live out in the country or, or whatever. I'm not sure a department head really needs, I think it's more important to have your police officers in the city than it is to have you know, the head of my, public works. My argument for department heads is they're the ones that make the decisions that affect the city. Oh, yeah. Okay. So to avoid any, un, any conflicts of interest that, with surrounding towns and burgs and stuff, okay. they live in the city. What they do, what they decide is for the benefit of the city, and they're not going to benefit from it because they live in the town or they live in the village they're, because they won't benefit because they live in the city. So the argument for directors was... Uh, they make decisions affecting the city, therefore they should live in the city. Don't you think there's a morale issue too? I mean, all these people are employed by an entity and none of them wants to live there? <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I don't know. I, this finance director thing is kind of interesting because, I mean, there's some nice places in the city and the person, mm -hmm. you know, and they, they're not finding somebody to live in the city uh, or even close. Uh, there's some nice uh, places on yeah. the north and various either north or yeah. south side. Uh -uh. And uh, so something and else think, must be going on that well, they can't I, find anybody. I think it's a difficult position to fill. Um, the school district is very lucky to have an excellent finance director, Roger Lies, worked with him. The county finance director is a very good individual, Tim Finch. And these guys not only bring, what I've seen as the key to their success, is they not only bring accounting ability and an understanding of budgets and so forth, but they're creative thinkers too. And they get the whole picture. And they understand, you know, what you need to do to make the whole picture work. They understand complicated funding, funding issues, and those folks aren't as plentiful as people who are, you know, entry-level mm -hmm. firefighters. And so I think it really has been difficult to find somebody. Um, you know, we've interviewed some good candidates, but I, th I think it's such an important position, boy. You know, one, you know, beyond your superintendent or county administrator or mayor, and the HR person is very important too, but I think a key position is in any municipality or government entity is the, is the finance guy it's or woman. It's difficult to make exceptions though. I mean, that's what they've been talking about maybe in mm -hmm. this position. They need to make an exception, but to say that that person is free to do what they want and the firefighter or teacher or someone else cannot, mm -hmm. it's really yeah, not yeah. treating somebody equitably. Mm -hmm. You know, this bill in the legislature, it was came up every two years to prohibit municipalities from having um, mm -hmm. residency requirements. And one of the, the things that was brought up frequently is today that most families have two incomes. And it's with, with the dominance of government employment today, it's not unusual to find one spouse working in a school district and somebody else working in as a firefighter or a police sure. officer. Now, who is now more worthy to where do you live? And sometimes that makes it more difficult. Uh, the bills never passed, and the main, main reason they didn't pass was because of the uh, Milwaukee situation where they were afraid of additional white flight. Mm -hmm. that uh, white police officers, white firefighters, and so on would live in the suburban areas and you'd mm -hmm. continue to have people of color in municipal employment living in a city. And so the racial card was usually the one that did in the bill. The bill. Oh, but yeah. there were always good arguments to say that with spouses and so on, and the situation of, of talent, um, are not we hiring anyone, whether it's a police officer or whoever, based on talent and not where they live uh, is more important criteria. Right, yeah, I mean, there are complex policy issues yeah. on both sides, so. Well, I do hope that um, the headhunter finds some good finance department candidates because uh, it, is, it, it, it is a kind of a key position. Looking in the conf you know, confidentials, you're in the room, is it a matter of the salary schedule not being competitive? Or is oh, it just that no. you haven't reached that point, the discussions where money comes onto the table yet? Right, I, and, and I, 
I think there have been a variety of you know factors that have that have gone into the various interviews and so forth. And sometimes it seems like there's a fit. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, it's okay. just how those things go. I'm just saying, like superintendents, county administrators, finance people, human resources, these folks don't grow on trees. Even that beautiful tree over there, um, those they're they're hard to find. And um, I think the city had done a good job of searching, but it really needs to ramp it up a little bit. So I think. Well, Gebhardt was the first appointed finance director. Oh, is that right? Because prior to that, we had a comptroller treasurer with, uh, was it Metcher? Uh, they elected, it was an elected position, and the city uh, uh, decided to uh, make it an appointed position a non-elected position, and Geb Hart was our first finance director. Is that right? So now we're I looking for our that. second finance director, and maybe okay. uh, we were fortunate the first time around, and maybe yeah. well, I think as Rich a first did a time. fine job. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think Rich, you know, is very competent and, and capable, but the job has grown infinitely yeah. more complex, and I don't think you'd want to elect a finance director. My goodness, no, yeah. I, uh, I just don't. There may don't. be a logistical problem here. I don't know if that's true or not, but. Many of the people who are in uh, that position, whether La Crosse, Eau Claire, Appleton, Oshkosh, Fond du Lac, Sheboygan, they're all about the same size community. And you wonder if those folks who are in those positions elsewhere and very competent at their job don't want to do a, a lateral move to Sheboygan. Mm -hmm. They want to go to Milwaukee or somewhere mm -hmm. else to probably get bigger bucks and maybe more prestige and so on. So maybe there is something you know, other than just the, the, the fact that they can't get somebody to move to Sheboygan, there's something about the slot that Sheboygan's in, mm -hmm. in pay scale and size and so okay. on, yeah. that yeah. makes it more difficult as well. And I think I can say that at least my perception is that residency requirements have not been the issue. Yeah. Um, I think it's just the right fit, and it's, it's a complex position to fill, so, so I wish the city luck. When I recall a while, long time ago, that the city did have a re residency requirement for its city employees. Yep. Because I recall some of my friends going through young guys who lived, wanted to, they grew up, as you said, in Sheboygan Falls. They liked the community, and there was all sorts of, you know, cat and mouse games being played about renting apartments and, and subletting it to somebody else, uh, some kid or some young people. But yep, your name, yep. your name, and your mail went to all of that, and all those kind of machinations. And then the city, while I was on the council, that was what I kind of worked on, was able to remove the residency mm -hmm. requirement, except for what we, my compromise was directors or, mm -hmm. you know, heads of departments. And it lives on. And the it lives on. The record is not broken. And it's still, so. but it's <laughs> up to, the union's gonna change it now. We're gonna have, new hires are gonna have to live in the city. And then if you're gonna have the firemen, then why not the policemen? And then and why not public works? And then any new hire has to live in the sure. city. Like you said, don't play special favorites. <laughs> now, was this, was this <laughs> discussion uh, about the trade-off between firefighters in the future living in the city and the ambulance service going their way, that was after the decision was made to give it to the fire department? Or was that That's background discussion that <laughs> was in part of the process of considering whether to... I don't know. Yeah, I don't that's know. interesting. Yeah. yeah. And we just aren't going to get into that. <laughs> so I... Um, uh, the backdoor okay. deal, right? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I only know what I read in the newspaper, so... So there you go. <laughs> um, we're going to move right along now, gentlemen. And speaking of jobs and... Inquiring minds need to know. There you go. Now you don't know the rest of the story. Um, in terms of keeping a job, uh, Mayor Perez, um, it was the Saturday headline a, a week or so ago, I think, is um, um, certainly made some statements that would, would give you cause to think that he is running again. Apparently this was the Brats for Breakfast event, which I did not attend. Sounds like it was a good time. John McGivern from Milwaukee was one of the performers, for lack of a better word, and he's extremely entertaining, so I think it would have been, uh, would have been fine. Um, let's put this in the context of a presidential race that we're all sorely tired of. <laughs> but um, any thoughts on the mayor's when is casual the, when announcement? Is the mayor's? That will be in April of 2009. Okay, so okay. that's a long way off. It's a little four, early. We a four-year term. <laughs> and, then, and not, uh, uh, I guess I'm not surprised the mayor is, if what he said is true, is certainly considering another run. 
What was interesting to me in the article is he said, I think it should only be for two terms. And uh, any thoughts or? As if anybody will remember in 2013 what yeah. he said in 2007. Yeah. I, I saw well, somebody a, will dig it up and, and call it that. There's a whole group of Newt Gingrich Republicans who said the same thing. You sure. Know, term mm -hmm. limitations term are good. Limits, yeah. When their term limit came up, boy, they, they, were they quiet. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're still there, many of them. Mm -hmm. exactly. well, I don't think it's unusual. I mean, he, he, well, first term, you're really learning the job. Right. You, you make your mistakes, and he's made his mistakes politically. And I think uh, he's going to learn. He's going to grow. And uh, the second term tends to be the one where you oftentimes can be very effective. And so I think uh, it's logical for him to look to a second term. I do, too. I mean, the council has changed really fairly dramatically. Um, and a lot of the shenanigans from those first two years, just or the first year, I should say, just really haven't co aren't coming up anymore. Uh, particularly, and um, so, um, well, I... I don't know if it was a trial balloon just to see how people react and respond or whether it really was a comment that he said without really thinking about it because those great political investigative reporters, Dave and Carol, asked him. <laughs> uh, or, or maybe it was an attempt strategically to get a sense of who might be out there and is going to run against him down the road, but... Um, I don't think anybody's surprised he's going to run for a second term. I yeah. Think. It didn't yeah. knock me over with a feather, certainly. Yeah. And um, I think you're right. I know his point was pretty much like yours, is that, you know, you spend some time learning the job and you finally get some momentum and pretty soon you're running for office again. And uh, yeah. well, let's see. We'll see what the voters think in a couple yeah. of years. Yeah. Well, we'll be, I'll be so tired of politics and every permutation by November of 2008 that... Uh, I saw Fred, this is a real di digressing point, but I saw Fred Thompson on one morning show, and he looked tired and he hasn't even started, so yeah. hey. <laughs> he was kind of laid back. Well, and uh, well, he had to go out to California, and David, I mean, uh, so with Leno, that's, that's yeah. late. Well, actually, it's taped, I think, at about 7 o'clock at night, so that yeah. may be a long day for the senator. That's right. Former senator. Well, Schwarzenegger um, declared on the Jay Leno show, so... I mean, it's must be required it's, now. It's getting to be a political tradition. You wouldn't want to do that, probably. In uh, oh, what else we got? Letterman. Come on, I'm sorry. <laughs> we got we got gangs. We got bridges. We got police stations. Come on, come on. You want to switch chairs here? <laughs> I was going to move on to the story, which I thought was pretty thorough for the press about gangs in in Sheboygan and um, uh, numbers and so forth. I do remember when I was on the school board, there were very significant concerns about gang activity, even at the middle school level. And then that very much tapered off as I was leaving the board. And I don't know what your sense of it is. I mean, clearly there's gang activity at the, in the schools, how, how broad, how wide it is. Um, I don't know. I thought the article was, was, was pretty thorough. I do question whether half of the crimes committed in the city of Sheboygan are gang crimes. I, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So there are very few violent crimes in Sheboygan. Um, there are some, of course, but most of the crimes, the vast majority of crimes in the in the city, are are either property crimes. Um, there's some Vandalism. domestic violence, which I actually yeah, is a violence, abandoned. but not a DVO domestic violence. Those are usually charged out as ordinance or um, I'm sorry, misdemeanors. Um, Possession of marijuana, as opposed to selling it, is, I mean, those make up very significant chunks of, of crime. So I don't know, um, and maybe there'll be some further explanation from the police department as to how they arrived at those figures, and they could be true, I don't know. Um, what's your sense? Ken, you're in the school system. Well, it's, you know, again, it's something that seems to uh, rear its ugly head, and then it's addressed in a variety of ways, and then it seems to go away for a while or go underground, and students aren't aware of it or talking much about it, and then it comes back again, and so it seems like a virus that sort of pops up from time to time. Uh, it's a kind of constant game of cat and, and, cat and mouse, um, where students who uh, are affiliated with groups and how serious they are and how much it's a wannabe thing, um, it's, it's a little tough to determine, and how they demarc them, demarcate themselves is really getting kind of bizarre. As a Roman Catholic, I guess right now that one of the one of the things is rosaries, 
of all things. <laughs> um, and, you know, because what the kids are, you know, some of those kids are probably attempting to do is to see if we're going to try to regulate what is a religious object and, and see if we run afoul of the First Amendment and all that kind of thing. Well, that's so actually that that right thinking. Yeah, you know, so at least <laughs> they're, they're, learning, there. they're learning the separation of church and state, state. And, you know, yeah. the free exercise clause <laughs> and all that sort of thing in the First Amendment. Um, I, I think that uh, in terms of walking down the halls and classroom, the day-to-day -day life uh, within the classroom, probably it's not affecting instruction. It certainly isn't affecting instruction, I don't, really don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens after school when people get off grounds or sometimes we got people staring at one another and giving each other looks in the halls, those are the things you kind of keep an eye on. Most of our, uh, the, the very few times you've got fights breaking out, interestingly enough, it's, it's more female on female uh, in the last couple of years, at least at South, I can't speak to the North experience. And it's, it's, it's not really particularly gang related as much as, you know, somebody stealing somebody else's boyfriend kind of thing. Uh, but the district, I mean, uh, South High School in the district has spent time uh, training one of their assistant principals at considerable expense to go to various conferences about uh, gangs and you know get acquainted with gang graffiti and gang rites of passage and all that sort of thing. And I know that Tim Patton, our police liaison officer, and some of the other security staff, we have really three full-time security staff people at South now. Um, one officer, one retired officer, and one you know kind of quasi-para security person. Uh, we really are spending a lot of time wandering around halls and Custodial staff is constantly cleaning up what little graffiti pops up from time to time immediately to keep things from being marked off and all that sort of thing. So, I have to just say that in terms of graffiti, and, and one of the pictures was you know somebody, a city worker, I think, cleaning graffiti off. From my perspective, that's a pretty important thing to do. Yeah. We were surprised visiting in Switzerland, you know, what you always think of as the kind of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant capital of the world um, about uh, five years ago, six years, um, Basel and Zurich covered with graffiti. You couldn't go past a bridge or a building that wasn't covered with graffiti. And it was, I think, at a certain point, people just lost the will to, 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 clean to, to clean it up. It just became so overwhelming. And not that life is you know, degraded necessarily, but it would just surprise me. And I do think it's important from my perspective, at least for municipalities to say, you don't get to deface property here. We're, mm -hmm. no matter how right, much it control. costs, yeah. we're gonna clean it up yeah. because that's what we want our community to look like, not with all these stupid drawings and, yeah. and such. And, and at least so far, I mean, I think that, you know, good efforts are, are typically made to, to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought it was. I uh, I thought the whole series was was interesting, and uh, you know I don't know whether it'll fade in and out or. I think it depends on how well the community assimilates uh, cult, different cultures and different races. I think that's if you look at these gangs, the growth of gangs in Sheboygan compared today is to 20, 30 years ago, um, and they have a lot to do with who's fully accepted, who hangs out with who. Um, and if we don't integrate and accept and acculturate, I guess, the different groups, uh, you're going to have these pockets that are going to stay out there, people who are frustrated and have a chip on their shoulder and so on. So it's a challenge for the community in many ways, I think. As, as an aside, you know, who, who, who gets together? I thought of during the basketball season, you've got Desitals group. Now, is that a gang? I mean, they're, they, they're together. It's a cult. Huh? It's a cult. It's a cult. <laughs> it's a cult. Okay. But, and then you got the Donahue gang. So yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And but that's just it's... a sad little group. <laughs> um, well, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And um, um, I do think it does, re you know, reflects different unassimilated cultures and uh, the theory behind gangs is that we all need to belong to something. Right, yeah. And if you are in a culture where you don't have a family to belong to or 
a, a, a social structure, the gang becomes your family, and um, so it's... Um, and the frustration level rises. That, that, that's one analysis that they're making of uh, the violence that the Islamic uh, segments in Britain and so on, those people are very much, while they're part of the labor pool, they are not assimilated whatsoever. The, the Islamic folks in the United States, as much as we oftentimes talk about a Christian nation, do assimilate people of other religions better than they do in Europe. And so you've got a generation of people over there who have a, really a chip on their shoulder for, for not being, don't see any upward mobility or don't see, see acceptance. And so they are apt in many cases to turn to violence and they're, they're British citizens. They grew up in Britain, for example. And, exactly. And they're caught making bombs or something, you know. So right. it's important that we be sensitive to diversity in our society and, and not let it, let it go off on their own and develop uh, antisocial type activities. And if people are educated, and if they do have decent jobs, mm -hmm. again, yeah. they have the, the, the life that's... They participate. Sure. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So, Well, the police are busy with gangs. They're also going to be busy moving into their new police station. Yeah. A really nice groundbreaking ceremony. I was not there. Um, it was, uh, but I, I do hear that um, Chief Kirk shook Mayor Perez's hand, and I, uh, <laughs> I uh, any pictures of that? Uh, yeah. I think there was. Oh, one, I put that in a real life <laughs> campaign, <laughs> prop. Yeah, yeah. Of some kind yeah. Of flyer. Yeah. Well, I think it is. I think it was a great day. There was a band. There was cake. Um, uh, there were speeches. There, there were all the the trappings of a of a glorious new building being built, and uh, so I think. Uh, now the mayor and the police chief didn't, you know, lock arms and eat cake like they do at a wedding or anything. Like no, that, do they? Okay. not. Because that would have been real groundbreaking. Yeah. The, Man, from I what I understand, by today and I saw mounds yeah. of dirt and everything yeah. else. So it's going on there. So I, it'll be interesting uh, to to have that new building. And uh, will there be a lessening of, ga <laughs> of gang activity? I don't think so. But uh, uh, one of the things that just came up is that budgetary. You not only have to plan for building, but you have to plan for maintenance. It's like when you move into a big house, a house that you're a bigger house than you're used to takes a lot longer to clean and uh, so I think that the uh, maintenance activities are, are going to be substantial. Other good news for the police department was the hiring of a Hmong police officer. I think from a gang perspective it's critical to have people in authority be respected by um, minor minority cultures and so I think it's a long time coming yes. and um, considering the size of the Hmong youth Yes. Population in Sheboygan. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I am not sure, I do not believe that there are any Hispanic officers on the force right now. There used to be um, a great guy who, you know, got a better, in his mind, better job. Um, so I think recruiting women and minorities is, is, is real important. Still don't have a woman firefighter. When I was on police and fire, that was my goal for five years: is just to get one woman to interview, and that never happened. So I think there are some big challenges that come up there. But as the face of uh, Sheboygan changes, I think it's important to to have authority figures change as well. It's been a great, quick half hour. Thank you. We'll see you again. Thanks. <laughs>